Today we are uh, joined by a couple of very interesting guys in, in the media distribution food chain. So let me introduce Steve Christian and uh, O'Brien McKinley. And Steve, why don't you give us a, a brief on what Veramatrix is all about? Yeah, um, Veramatrix is in the business of uh, content security. So we protect uh, the video distribution from all types of, uh, of content, from DVB broadcast content to streaming content, IPTV content, and so on. Basically, helping people put together the business models that uh, that enable the, the cash register to keep uh, to keep running. So that include like watermarking content and fingerprinting it. In, in it essence? does. What watermarking is what we call one of the sort of additional layers of the protection onion, if you like. But obviously, fundamentally, uh, encryption and uh, output control and other kinds of technologies are. Uh, important in this kind of mix. Okay, and so you're working hand in glove with broadcasters and media companies to form their digital strategies for the various appliances in the market. Yeah, yeah, in particular multi-network and multi-device kind of strategies. Perfect, okay, O'Brien? Yes, thanks Mike. Um, Brian McKinley with Flowcom Systems. Um, we're a uh, multi-facet systems integration infrastructure provider. Started out as uh, a one of the strong satellite uh, uplink providers. Um, and have grown dramatically over the course of the years of our service uh, for satellite service, system integrations, and up to and including now, which we host uh, the mass control operations and VOD delivery for a little company called Showtime. So we're very diverse. We have five verticals, if you will. Uh, we work in the government. We work in wireless. Uh, we work in the broadcast media entertainment area, of which I oversee, um, and data and enterprise technologies. Great. Now, this will be an open session, so if you raise your hand, we'll have somebody come find you and ask you a question. Um, so if there's a burning topic, jump at any old time. But let me, let me start, Steve. When I, when I look at, there's two things I always think about in this business. One is follow the money, and so far as I can tell, most of the linear traditional channel businesses are still where most of the money is. But then you also follow the energy. And it seems to me that all the energy is being directed towards the non-linear or non-traditional channels available to consumers as we watch uh, our kids and everybody else's kids um, find different ways to get to the content they want. So, so how's that dynamic working and, and what do you see coming out of that? Well, it, it's certainly true. I think that uh, a lot of the energy we've seen thus far has been directed towards on-demand, what I call on-demand content or non-linear non content. Um, and that's been, I think, a function uh, partly of the way the technology has been introduced into the marketplace. And I don't think it's necessarily fully representative of what the consumer really wants to, uh, how, they want, how they want to see a complete video service. Uh, I, I, I continue to, to believe that uh, a mix of linear, live, and, and on demand is the kind of representative of the service that people want to see on their connected TV sets on their tablets, as well as they're on their traditional big screens in the, in the living room. So um, I, I, do think, I do think that energy is gradually shifting. You're seeing um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the TV everywhere kind of uh, heading, you're seeing the great popularity of things like the Time Warner um, tablet application. And, and that's kind of interesting to me that uh, the first opportunity that people have got to use a tablet uh, as, a, as really as a TV. And, <laughs> God knows, the iPad is one of the greatest little t portable TVs that I've ever seen. It's the first thing I thought about when I held it in my hand on uh, April a year ago. Um, that, that, that live application has become really a, 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 an emblematic of, of being able to distribute a tr more traditional service across different devices around the home and potentially outside of the home as well. So I think we're gradually going to see the energy balance up between the the on-demand and the, and, the, and the live content uh, uh, consumption models. Right, O'Brien, in your case, you operate Teleport. You do a lot of systems integration and solution development for, for programmers. What are you seeing coming out of, of, of the, that exchange? Well, we're seeing, and we work with a lot of uh, content providers. Um, and the one thing that really stands out now is the lack of a ubiquitous network. Um, in other words, everybody has their own niche for product delivery or content delivery. As an example, the iPad, which is great you know, for that mobile TV and TV anywhere. You look at Google and Google Analytics. All of those have their own uh, DRM or type of delivery device. So 
if you want global content media, if you will, or global delivery, there has to be some ubiquitous, again, using that word, form of open wear in order for many people to deliver much content across you know, the human eyes, such as you and I. Um, and, and if you don't, uh, one thing that we actually have in our test lab, you know, we have five or six different set-top boxes, and each of them are specific to an application or content delivery mechanism, which I don't see how the consumer can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what that points to is either a, the stovepipe analogy, where a programmer is trying to do everything cradle to grave in terms of their delivery of their right. content, um, somebody pretty zealous about maintaining brand identity and the like across platforms and media and appliances and devices, versus a platform operator's perspective on all that. We are seeing more than a little creative tension in that. Some of the news over the last week has been about um, Cablevision and some others developing a mobility play or an app play um, with or without the tacit consent of some of the programmers who are, are crying foul in terms of use or in terms of application. Anybody want to comment on, on where that's going? Well, I, I, I did use the, the Time Warner example. Cablevision is another example of, of that uh, attempt to move uh, consumption onto um, let's say tablet devices, but I think it goes beyond tablet devices into, into smartphones and other kinds of uh, TVs. Um, it, it's an example of, of, of the uh, response, I think, to, to what I see as a latent sort of consumer desire to use this new internet delivery medium to, to balance up, as I said, the on-demand and live, live content feeds. So the, the, um, the technology behind it is interestingly what seems to be the issue. Uh, streaming from the cloud versus streaming from a gateway seems to be uh, a, a, an important legal point that seems to be debated. And um, uh, just, the, just the protocols and the protections and the, and the restrictions on the service that, uh, that, are, that are put in place seems to, be, uh, seems to be a point of contention as well, which is uh, really quite, quite intriguing. You've got you to believe that's the, just the thin end of the wedge that if that really is a popular kind of consumption model, then we're going to see a, a breakdown of, of some of those restrictions, some agreement on, on how those services will be more globally available. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you know, some improvements in, in the picture for services, for internet services and, and uh, consumer acceptance of those services. So. Right, and where you're seeing the real creative tension on that is on the regulatory front, because I don't think the regulators are either up on the technology or up on the issues um, and they're a generation behind in terms of thinking about it. I look at the, 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 the fight between <laughs> my new corporate parent, Level 3, and Netflix as a, um, a, as a classic case in point with them and, and Comcast and the rest about you know, whose network is it, whose customer is it, who's supposed to pay, what is fair carriage, um, what is a peering relationship, and all these things that have everything to do with uh, ultimately follow the money. Yeah. Well, let's look. Take a step back and look where we came from. We had managed TV, which still is a great model, and that's where I would say 90% of the money or revenue streams are actually made still today. You know, the big four, now the big five, make a ton of money with those revenue streams, especially during the evening day part. But then if we learn from our peers over the recording industry, that little hacker program, if you will, called Napster, the industry was so afraid of it, did not take that proactive approach, and they were, again, behind the eight ball in order to make it a profitable business model. But now if you look for such platforms as iTunes, um, even Amazon and Google, they've taken a similar approach, but in a proactive fashion where it's a one-to-many model. So being able to take that one delivery device and hone it across multiple applications. I was just recently at a partner's summit convention meeting uh, with a big IT firm. And it was funny, the CTO there came up, came up and made her due diligence speech and said, let's look at CES. This time last year, CD CES had four tablet type models being delivered to the US, or being delivered domestically to the consumer. This year there were 70, can't quote me, but 72, 73 
different models, again, different applications that can be delivered. So we still are on leading edge technology, but we still don't have that, again, that, that similar like open platform. But then when you get to that, you know, on my uh, colleagues talk here, talking about security. Right. You know, and security is a big thing, especially when you get into the cloud. Well, and of course, yeah, this stuff is transported between multiple business models, multiple, multiple licensing arrangements and the like. But if you, if you think about the traditional model, the, um, you had a content owner, you had a distribution channel partner, but of course now there are two other players in that exchange. One is the appliance or the device, and two is the transport, a Google TV or an Amazon as a classic case in point, which is trying to disintermediate some of the other traditional platforms. And clearly Netflix falls into that camp. The last guys to really break into the, student, the movie biz, movie transport business um, that really broke through, of course, were HBO and Showtime back in the day. But of course, what happened over time was the studios got wise, got jealous, and started clamping down on the product that they made available to those channels. And of course, the only reaction HBO and Showtime could do was to create original content of their own to control the content they delivered. So again, do you see an analog and a corollary to that in Netflix or, or Google in terms of creating an opportunity for, pro, for content <laughs> owners? Um, I, I, do see, I do see cycles repeating themselves for sure. Um, one of the things that strikes me about the whole sort of uh, Netflix, um, Hulu kind of uh, uh, prominence in the marketplace is that you know, the, more, the more you look at them and the longer they go on, the more they look like your traditional cable companies, just, just using a different kind of wire. Uh, and uh, uh, that's especially true of Hulu, for instance, um, and um, with all the same problems and things like that, but, but the same opportunities as well. You know, you're putting a brand out there and a service out there, and, and, and you're trying to, uh, uh, to be the go-to place, be the destination place. Netflix has done a spectacular job of that in terms of um, movies or, or long-tail movie content, I think. Uh, but the traditional players, the traditional... Um, what I call pay TV players, cable, satellite, and so on, they still have a big place in the living room. They still are, uh, have a big brand, a big consumer relationship, and a, uh, an opportunity to use their, their pipes and their uh, content bouquets to, um, to create and extend their brand beyond the living room, the big, the big screen in the living room, to these other, these other platforms. Hence, hence the, uh, the, the versatility of the apps, and the app model, which doesn't just benefit content owners by direct access, it also benefits aggregators and, and pay TV operators, I, I think, as well. So. Well, well, given that, that breakdown in the traditional um, model, and of course a lot more outlets for the consumer, consumer's clearly gonna win here. Uh, Steve, I look at what, you, what, um, what you're providing, of course, you're essentially an arms dealer, arming <laughs> one side or the other in this campaign of trying to yeah. manage the content through. So, you know, obviously, um, Multiplicity of channels and outlets is actually a benefit. It gives you more opportunity to, to engage in conversation. In, yes? in, indeed, it does. That means, uh, of course, that there are, you know, our, our customers are the operators. Now, operator now is a generous term that includes an online operator as well as a, a traditional cable or satellite player. So, yes, there are more opportunities, the, 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 and the numbers are, are very substantial. Um, when, when we think about ourselves as an arms dealer, yeah, we are in some sense arming people, but it's not quite taking pot shots at each other. It's, it's in the interests of, you know, becoming more competitive, gaining, gaining a more competitive share, and, and uh, occupying more of the, uh, the viewing time of the, uh, of the consumer out there and the subscriber's household. So. Yeah, okay, arms dealer. Um, oh, Brian? Okay, <laughs> I, I stand accused and... Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I make my living trading on both sides of that side of uh, yeah. the equation too, Steve. This is the bot and the kettle. Yeah. But, um, well, Brian? Well, you know, with the bouquet of content that's out there and combining that with, the, again, the bouquet of delivery, uh, the OTT model, the over-the-top model, seems to be very prominent. You right. know, the Hulus, the Netflixes, which, you know, is, is definitely a good model, uh, business model to follow. But do we, how do we amortize that? You know, this right. is where the debate comes in. How do we amortize and make money off of that model? Outside, let's throw Netflix off to the side, you know, with Hulu. You know, you've got, when you click on, let's say, for example, Saturday Night Live, 
you've got that 15 second commercial, which is a great time to go get your favorite beverage, come back and you're done. Compare that to linear TV, mm -hmm. you know, where you're a captive audience right there. How do you make money off of that? And, and that's a question, you know, that, that people that we're working with for those business solutions are trying to wrap their arms around uh, because they're still not yet vested in those opportunities for the OTT style model. And the TV anywhere is a great concept. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, Brian, aren't you making a tacit assumption there that advertising type revenue is the only way this stuff gets funded? It, uh, or are you considering the sort of mix of paid subscription type uh, Well, and services? that's the question. You know, does, does the average consumer want to pay $8 from one application when they could get it from other areas for free. Right. And then if so, how, for those applications where you can get it for free, how can you generate revenue from that? Right. I, I, I think that when you, you look around um, on the internet, you're finding much less sort of free and easy anonymous browsing content out there, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still the illegal sector, of course, but let's talk about legitimate services. Right. I think that, that um, the, the, the free and easy access to, um, to online content that you in, in saw in the sort of first days of Hulu, I think that's being really retracted. And I think a lot of more of it's going behind the, the subscription fence, which is one of the reasons for my mm -hmm. observation that it looks more and more like a cable company. It may not be the same pricing as a cable company, but it's, it looks in terms of in terms of the mix of content they have, it looks more like a cable company. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, it seems to me a lot of it's been the noble experiment, right? To figure yeah, out where the, yeah. where the and, water level is and, or where customers will pay. And, and of course, you know, well, it, it, it's just disruptive initially and everyone leapt on the bandwagon to try and, you know, establish that brand. But uh, at the end of the day, you've got to, you know, create a viable business. And, and the business model that's worked pretty well in the pay industry um, is this mixture of advertising and sub subscription and good heavens, you know, that, 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 that business is still going pretty strong actually. So. Right, well I actually want to make a corollary to the print, print media market. I mean there's, there's been, there's an argument that's out there that says New York Times, which of course um, was free, it went to, to pay, it failed, it went back to free, it's now trying a limited kind of use before you pay model and the story and the analogy that some say is, well, you know what, given their high print costs and delivery costs, they could actually give every one of their subscribers an iPad and be ahead of the game um, in terms of, of, of where their cash goes, because they're just consumers of paper. Um, and so do you, you know, if you think about that in the live video managed video space, um, do you see those same kind of rules applying? And do you see people finding the right level and what's this do to linear channels? Uh, if we use the New York Times analogy, I think that uh, I, I'm actually, uh, the other day I su almost surprised myself. I actually did put in my credit card and, and, uh, and, and uh, is pa uh, paying several bucks a month, I think, for unlimited access to the New York Times. And, and I figured it, you know, it's a good service. I, I read it 20 times every day. It, it makes sense. So, uh, so let's, let's, let's jump on board the bandwagon because I don't think, uh, uh, an unlimited font of free material is is sustainable, and and I think that's true in the in in the video world, uh, even more true in the video world really in, uh, than is in the in the newsprint world. So these cycles are um, interesting. They're all out of step with each other, but right. but the cycles are informative because they they do bleed from one industry to another. So again, I agree with you for that. You know, taking the the New York Times business model hopefully of making it applicable, but then at a certain price point, because as you know, if you charge too much, you're gonna drive them away. Don't charge enough, they're not gonna buy it. But then taking that, that efficient business model, applying it, again, and I go back to that one-to-many solution, because right now there are too many players out there that are doing too many things to try and garner that corner of the market. Mm -hmm. um, so we're back to the same problem again, you know, and, and taking out of uh, the scenario, you know, the TV anywhere, the mobile devices, yeah, obviously you have to pay a premium in order to be part of the Apple consortium, 
Google, you know, and those type of brands, you know, it's an open freeware system with some security, security issues, which Steve, you could help mm -hmm. very dramatically upon. Then you have the RIM devices, right. which is, you know, one of the, I won't say it's a trailing edge, but its niche audience is not, you know, the, the 1080i TV anywhere system. It's made for business applications. Right. So taking all of that and then trying to formulate a proof positive solution system that's affordable, that's reliable, and efficient, which are right. two different schemes, is going to be very difficult. Okay, I'm going to posit a question here where I actually think that brand matters. Um, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting the cut from Robert here. So this will be our final question, unless there's some compelling burning interest out of the audience. But the question here for me is I think what we're, we're circling around is brands matter. Right, that the world is not evolving to YouTube video in and of itself, though there is always some interesting stuff that's populated there, that brands and platforms matter. So if you look at it, whether it's the traditional cable or linear channel model, the content model, um, or these new disruptive things, the Googles, the Apples, the Netflix, uh, consumers are clearly going to win, but, who, uh, but pick winners and losers out of that melee. And that, that's where we'll leave the panel. <laughs> That's, that's a Come question. On, guys. That's a Give question. Me. I I I believe brands do matter, and I do think the uh, the brands that of existing, should we should we call them pay TV players? I think those those are brands that people do uh, trust to some extent, and and have had long term relationships with, and they value the the aggregation service that they that they bring. So I think that's equally true in the in the app based world of of uh, uh, the next few years as it is. With a with a dedicated set top box, um, I, I do think there are uh, issues to be dealt with clearly in terms of uh, the standards that are being used for video transmission on the internet and the and the the ability to protect those uh, those transmissions in in an equitable fashion, make money out of them. Uh, but those are the, those are the technology wrinkles that we're dealing with right now. But at the heart, at the end of the day, it's who the consumer wants to have a relationship with, and that means um, building a brand. So. Absolutely, brand management is key. You want to protect your brand, it's value added for that end user, and by protecting that brand, it will keep the audience coming back. But then again, like Steve said, we have to deal with all the conglomerate on the upside of that. I think a winner right now for the openness, if you will, but still secured area, is Google. Take that and then with uh, like DCE TV, which is the uh, digital consumer ecosystem. You know, uh, they have five of the top uh, set, uh, excuse me, studio sets out in Hollywood, or four, and one of them not being Disney, they're going their own way. Um, and looking at a refined position to deliver that one-to-many system. So I, between that, you know, which is the upstream effect for DCE TV, and then the downstream effect is which is how to get the content to those providers as well as the distributors as well as that end user is definitely a decent model to take consideration too. Great. Well, so long as nobody can figure out the real answer, I think there's an employee for all of us in this room because we all don't <laughs> want to work for Google or Apple at the end of the day anyways. So thank you for your time and your attention thank and you. enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.